Um, Gabriel, as we come towards the end of this conversation, just to close the loop on something you mentioned earlier, which is women and increased rates of chronic disease. Mm. I don't want to leave that open-ended. Uh. Um, could you just explain maybe why you think there may be a relationship there? Well, if you take something like multiple sclerosis, which I've mentioned a number of times, the gender ratio in the 30s was about one to one. Yeah. So if each man diagnosed there'd be a woman, the gender ratio now is three and a half women for every man. Now that tells us a few things immediately. Can't be genetics, because that doesn't change over a short period of time. Can't be the diet or the climate, because that doesn't change more for one gender than the other. What is it? It's stress. Now if you look at those four character traits that I said contributed to the onset of illness, the emotional concern for the needs of others, the uh, suppression of healthy anger, the uh, identification with duty, role, and responsibility, the belief that you're responsible for the people's emotions and you mustn't disappoint anybody, which gender is acculturated in our society to take on those traits more than the other? Of course, it's women. So women have 80% of autoimmune disease. Yeah. 80% of autoimmune disease are women. And big mystery. It's not a mystery. They're acculturated to play a certain role. Their role has always been to absorb the stresses of their families and also of their spouses. And certainly that's a role that my wife took on early in our relationship and she had to rebel against it to stay healthy. You know, um, there was a study in Sweden that showed that this is remarkable, that if a woman was depressed prenatally, that increased the risk of a late premature birth, 32 weeks to 36 weeks. If the man was depressed, the father was depressed prenatally, that increased the risk of an even earlier premature birth. Why? Because the woman was absorbing the stress of the man. And so women do that automatically, not biologically necessarily, but because that's the role they've been given in the society. Plus that they have to go out and work now as well to make a living and make a, um, you know, money for the family to survive and, or to just to succeed out there in the workforce. And people are more isolated than they ever were. So in Britain, there's, they, they appointed the Minister of Loneliness. So greater stress, more isolation. That's why women are getting more autoimmune disease. And during COVID, there was an article in the New York Times about women who took on the emotional stress of their husbands and their children during COVID, and they felt guilty because of the suffering of their men and their children, because it was somehow their job to, to eliminate or alleviate it. Well, that socially appointed and then automatically assumed role that women have been thrust into has physical implications. That's why women get most autoimmune disease. What if we just recognize this? You know, and this is a big mystery. No mystery. This is a particular dramatic example of the biopsychosocial nature of human beings. Yeah. Our biology is inseparable from our psychological functioning and our social relationships. Yeah. And who has the brunt of all that? Women of color. Yeah. They're much more likely to develop these diseases than Caucasian women. Why? Because of the added stress of social and, and, and racial yeah. uh, oppression you, or, or, or exclusion. I guess the culture, the society around us impacts so much of how we experience the world and, and what we chase and what we pursue and how we are. And of course, it can take a long time for culture to change. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying that people have to wait for the society to change. If they did wait... It'd be a long, long wait, I would think. So there's a lot that we can do, even in the context of this culture. Now, of course, what we can do is not totally um, freely uh, um, available equally to everybody. Let's face it, yeah. certain class of people have much less, fewer options than others. That's just the reality of this culture that we have to really look in the face, yeah. you know. But there's still a lot that people can do. And... But if I can go back to the confluence of your book and mine, you have these three concepts of, of the healing concepts of alignment, which is what I call authenticity, being, being, becoming true to ourselves. That's available to all, all of us. You talk about contentment, which I talk about in terms of acceptance, just actually yeah. recognizing how things are and being with them. Not necessarily that 
we don't want anything to be different, but that we don't stress ourselves about things. Thirdly, what you call control, which is what we've already talked about, what I call agency. Those are some core hearing principles that, interestingly enough, both you and I, without any um, discussion or awareness of what each of us is writing, why did we come up with that? Because yeah. they're real. And, that's, and we've seen them both in, 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 in medical practice and, and, and the function of them. Now, I add anger, another A called anger, which is, I think is very important for people to be able to say no and to... We have a system in our brain for healthy aggression. Yeah. Just as we have one for play, for love, for lust, for fear, for grief. We have systems in our brain for anger. Why? Because it has to protect us. So I think people need to be angry, not enraged, not chronically resentful, but they have to be able to say, no, you will not do this to me. No, you will not enter my space. No, you will not manipulate me. No, you will not use me. So that's a small yeah. microcosmic statement of my healing principles. But I certainly think that healing is possible. And let's face it, if you didn't think healing was possible, would you write your books? You know, I mean, if, if, I, if all you wanted to do is tell people how terrible things are, you wouldn't write a book. Yeah. We both write books because we actually believe in human beings, yeah. in, the, in the capacity of human beings for transformation and that there's some guidance that can be provided to promote that transformation. That's why we write, yeah. and that's why I wrote this book. And so, yes, healing is possible, but we have to be aware, I think, as I think you said earlier, we have to wake up to what's going on. Yeah. Until then, we're just working in the dark. Kabul, it's always a pleasure spending time with you. I feel very honored these days to call you a friend. Well, the sense of being honored is mutual. For sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.